Uh, thanks for joining us. Thanks for, uh, oh, thanks for water. Thanks for waiting. Um, yeah, we'll just get right into it. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to do an introduction. You may wonder who am I. I, I wonder that often, too. Um, my name is <laughs> Ryan Sands. I'm an indie comics publisher. Uh, so I published comics with Jillian Tamaki, Eleanor Davis, and uh, last two years ago published a book with Rebecca. Mm -hmm. um, based on your outfits and the number of people here, I don't think I have to spend a lot of time on an introduction, but I will anyway. Um, so <laughs> this is our friend, my friend Rebecca Sugar. She's a cartoonist, a writer, ukulelist, uh, currently living in LA. She's the author of the comics Pug Davis, Margot Ann Dread, Don't Cry For Me, I'm Already Dead, and many others. Uh, in her free time, she's also a multiple Annie and Emmy nominated storyboard artist, show creator, um, behind the groundbreaking television show Steven Universe. I said this last time, but not just the best animated show on television, but probably my favorite television show of all time. Oh, thanks, Ryan. Um, so today we're gonna talk about Steven. I have some Steven questions. Um, we'll have time for a Q&A at the end, um, but we're also gonna share some imagery that you may or may not have seen from Rebecca's earlier work and talk about what inspires her, a little bit about fandom, and just anything else that we wanna talk about. So, Please join me in welcoming Rebecca Sugar. Um, I just realized I was going to put a picture of my daughter dressed as Garnet oh. in the slideshow, but then I was like, Is it in there? "It's not, no." Oh, that's but if you a shame. Uh, if you come by, we'll show it to you on Instagram. No. <laughs> um, yeah. So I was just oh, I was just trying to show. Um, when I was backstage, you were gonna come find me. Yeah. And I was like, I must have a picture of Ryan so we, we know when he shows up, let it's him inside. It's not random, yeah. And, it's, and the picture I had of you is you with the shirt of the bubbled cluster <laughs> holding your newborn baby. <laughs> Which is just the get, most lovely. Well, I don't wanna get too, I don't wanna make this about me or get too emotional, but we, um, my wife's water broke at 3.30 in the morning, and so I started cleaning the apartment, which is not what you should do. And then, um, and then we were like, okay, quick, take a shower, get dressed, let's go. And then I put on that shirt because yes. I wanted to start things off on a very positive note. That's so lovely, thank you. Okay, so um, uh, Rebecca and I, we've been friends for a while, but we, we did another one of these kind of talking things um, a couple years ago, and then when I knew we were doing this today, I was like, oh crap, I already asked all my good questions. <laughs> um, but uh, that was two years ago, and I think a lot has happened um, yeah. in the show, in your personal life. Um, so we'll just kind of to dig in. But um, I wanted to start by asking, um, what is your life like currently now? Uh, specifically related to the show. <laughs> Not like, what do you have for breakfast? But um, I, I know some folks have heard uh, that there's a movie coming, and w I know personally that you're very one of the busiest, hardest working people I know. So can you talk us a little bit about how do your days and weeks go um, on, on your work? Well, right now, I'm doing a mix of movie, of movie and show. Mm -hmm. So I'm, and I'm always jumping from episode to episode. At, at any given time, we'll be working on 10 or 15 episodes at the same time where we're doing music on one, we're writing the premise for another, we're doing a board fit, pitch for another, we're doing design for two others, everything overlaps. Mm. Um, so now the, the movie is in the mix there mm. too. And um, it's really exciting, the schedule, is a is, let's talk about schedules. I'm just no, no, dry. I, it's it's um <laughs> it's a little different because it's just a very different project, and uh, so I'm sort of rolling with it. I've I've tried to learn to take things as they come uh, because you're always pl uh, punished if you tr if you try to plan ahead. I mean, everything is in, is incredibly planned ahead, but on the day to day, there's always three or four emergencies that happen that right. you have to run and solve or a new email about a new idea. Um, around Comic-Con time, uh, there, there becomes the added planning for Comic-Con, sure, sure. so that, that jumps in. And, um, yeah, it's every, every day is many things that are usually all different things, and Dude. always for different episodes. The, the interesting about how the sausage is made is that uh, in terms of it being a sausage, it's like if the sausage factory had to make a different sausage every time a sausage came out. So like, there's no one sausage formula for us. We have to reinvent the sausage every single time. Um, and so every 11 minute sausage is completely, a completely different um, 
based on artisanal whatever, it's not, you can charge a lot for the yeah. sausage. But, but usually yeah. there'll at least be more than one of that singular yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like flavor well, of sausage. Well, um, one thing I want to talk about it with the uh, Adventure Time just wrapped up. Um, so now you're kind of like one of the, I don't know if you feel like it, one of the old timers there. Oh, yeah, I really feel like <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, um It's almost been... It's almost been 10 years since I wrote my first song for TV, for, TV, for Cartoon that's Network. That's crazy. That's, it, it feels like yesterday. Yeah, that's wild. Um, can you talk a little bit about sort of what you learned from Adventure Time? I guess, especially from the early days about, I, I, I think one of the things people love about Adventure Time and about Steven is the way that you, the, the writers are empowered to really tell their own stories, to follow their own impulses. Mm -hmm. um, so can you talk a little bit about sort of yeah, what, what you learned from Adventure Time, and then maybe a little bit about the experience going back to help wrap it up. Adventure Time taught me that I could do personal work in, the, in, in a commercial animated show. Mm -hmm. We were really encouraged to do things that were personal and interesting and not like other shows. Mm -hmm. um, Honestly, writing for a character like Marceline, like even my personal work was often not as personal as the stuff I'd be writing for her, uh, just because that was what Penn uh, and Adam and Pat were interested in. And yeah. the more like independent comics, I thought I'll do ind independent comics on the side and I'll take a commercial animation job because I love both these things, but they're gonna be different. And they wanted it to feel like independent comics. Mm -hmm. um, and even my independent comics were a little goofier and stickier than they wanted Adventure Time to feel, so I was really digging deep. Uh, same with the music. Um, I had started out trying to write, when, we did, when I did It Came From the Nightosphere, which was the first episode that I boarded and wrote for. Um, thanks. <laughs> uh, that was an audience, that was a clapping cue, but no, okay. We're, we're. <laughs> it's cool, it's a long time ago. Um, yeah, I started out writing these big flashy musical numbers because yeah. that's the kind of stuff that, that I like. And then Penn came in and was like, let's just have this be a scene between these two people. Uh, and it just got so much smaller and more intimate. And that interest that they had in these small intimate moments, I remember one of the things I loved is um, they did a thing once where Finn touched his face and when he took his hand away, it left a little imprint, like a little pink mark that mm. faded off. That's really hard to do. That means there's a design for the pink spot on his mm. face. Mm -hmm. There's a, a director has to time the time it takes for the, for the pressed mark to mm -hmm. fade off. Just for this little moment of like, yeah. there's a pressure that happened when he put his hand to his face. That was fascinating to me. Mm. Who was doing something like that? Right. For TV animation, and TV animation, you don't have a lot of time to put subtlety in. Uh, so that really taught me you can do something subtle mm. in television animation. I don't know, I suppose maybe now, when early on when season one was coming out for Adventure Time, people didn't think Adventure Time and subtle. Maybe now that's different. Maybe they've gotten, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. You, you can all tell me if that, that's how we felt inside, like the level of subtlety we mm. were encouraged to bring and these little specific moments that was so unusual and I just fell in love with that and I mm. wanted to keep it going. And I guess for for your own writers, you you have the same sort of. How do you make it clear to them that they're free to to explore those things? Is it the way you do critiques, or is it just you give them a pep talk every Monday? Or yeah, because um, you're a, you're a leader of a team, right? Like in many ways, you're like a manager. You're a manager of a team. Yeah, I try to keep it very flexible. Mm. Uh, a lot of times, we'll come up with ideas in the room of the pitch. Once, mm. we, once we see a pitch and we all get excited about something, we'll start pitching jokes mm. on it. I really want everyone to be involved in every episode, which is a little different. With Adventure Time, we really, the, the tone could be so different from episode mm. to episode that like a Jesse episode or Tom episode would feel nothing mm -mm -mm. like maybe a me and Adam episode. Um, but on Steven, I think mm. it's, it's a little more trying to capture the energy of us being together in the room. Mm. And what I'll do is, because there's so much continuity, I make charts that basically say, here's what's important to me to happen in this episode, this episode, this episode, this, this episode. This is why this is happening mm -hmm. sort of across for a season, season length so that even if we get excited about something, will know kind of a framework where it's yeah. like, this still has to eventually arrive at this point. And if people don't like that point, we can all talk about why. Mm. We can um, 
you know, try and figure out, because sometimes that's the, that is the most exciting thing is when something is rubbing everybody the wrong way. Oh. Um, because mm. you know that there's something, whatever is like getting under your skin, like mm. there's something there, like it's gonna be difficult to do this right, but what is doing this right? Mm. Why is this wrong? Like that whole conversation mm. um, is always, some of I think our most interesting mm. ideas have come from these things that are like, we, we want some aspect of this, but what is the part that's holding us back mm. from actually getting there? And Is that is that sometimes because like someone suggests something you, th you, you or the team thinks like, this character wouldn't do that or wouldn't say that? Or are, are you, how, or how protective are you, I guess, of like, you, you know these characters better than anyone, of course, mm. but then the writers have, have their own ideas about what these characters are and how they've changed over time. So do you, how, do you, how do you fight that like tension? Or, or do you sometimes say, no, listen, Pearl would never say that and we can't do that and we're gonna rewrite this episode? <laughs> um, I mean, everything is super up in the air. Okay. Even, even as we're boarding, things are still subject to change. Mm, like nothing cool. is really locked in until the animatic is put together and, and right. we, you know, ev and we lock it and we send it off to be, to be animated. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, we're still changing lines like up until the last mm -hmm. second often. Um, you know, so these conversations like they start really macro and then they become really micro. Mm -hmm, so it'll mm -hmm. be like, you know, early on, it's not so much like would Pearl ever say this line? Yeah, it'll, yeah. it'll be like, what are we saying with this? Like, what do we what do we mean by this? Mm -hmm, like, what, mm -hmm. um, you know, what is left for this character to discover about themselves and is this supporting them discovering that? Like mm -hmm. it's really broad. Mm -hmm. um, and then as we get into premises and outlines, we're tying down the details, where are they? You know, what is the interesting way to, mm -hmm. what event can, can show you that they're making this progress? Like, mm -hmm. And then when we get to board stage, it'll be like, I think, you know, that's when we get like, I think Pearl would make a face like this. I, I see, think I that Amethyst would say a line like this. Uh, often it'll be you know, in a room with many of us in it. And um, let's see, I do with uh, Ian Jones Cordy, who does the show OKKO, OK ran Steven with me for some time. And he, he says I do a thing, he would call it like Rebecca-ing, which is where I like stand at the, at the wall staring at a couple of lines furiously writing and rewriting some new version of that line, usually for a really, really long time, oh. until I put a post-it on the wall, and then, I pitch, and then I just pitch the line to everybody, and then I just see if they laugh at it or not. And if they, <laughs> and if they do, then I'm like, all right, that's, that's what it is. And if they don't, I just go right, we just do round two, and I do it again. For those two minutes, is everyone silently like, what is she, what's <laughs> happening? I hope, I hope not. <laughs> I try not to take too long. No, no, no. Um, sometimes people will... Just chat, and I'll, and I'll try and keep going. <laughs> There's a big like smoke um, uh, cloud, and then they're like, oh, "We're gonna get a coffee. There, we'll be there back." Really is, well, it's a it's a post-it cloud. Often, I'll, like by the end of some of these, I'll be tracking post-its around the room on my shoes and on my clothes. Like, cat will pull post-its off yeah, of yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. Um, I feel I'm sorry to the production staff because they'll come into the conference room and it's just littered with crumpled up post-its that I didn't like, and I just like threw a, threw around. Which sometimes I am whisked away too fast to pick them up and. Yeah throw them away but it means you're dri yeah it means you're driving in some of them some of them will find later and they'll have some cryptic thing written on them <laughs> and we'll try and figure out what it was there's one there's one that says somebody has to paint somebody's nails black um, <laughs> yeah <laughs> which got picked up and stuck on the wall and it's still there i think it was about young greg oh okay i was like i want uh, but it didn't it didn't happen yeah but i guess we have to do it eventually well i remember <laughs> We did. We we talked two years ago. I mean, we've, we've talked in between them, but we talked in in public uh, two years ago. And you were reading notes off your phone, mm. some poetry and some notes, and that was like the joke. Like, which of these are notes and which are poetry? And I saw people in the comments being like, "She was talking about this scene in episode." Blah, yes, uh, yes. <laughs> and they're like, "That's the part of the. St it mentioned a stoplight. It has to be that." And I was like, "It was wow. for the last one out of each yeah, city." Yeah, yeah. Right. And they were right. That wouldn't be out for like probably a year. Yeah, it was wild. Well, because I was working on it right, probably right then. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Mm. Um, so, uh, for, for some, has everyone caught up with Steven? Are you guys, you guys are watching it? Yeah, okay. That's called, that's called pandering. <laughs> okay, well I was gonna say, I mean the last 10, 15 episodes, it really feels like you guys are cashing in on some big pieces of the story that have been sort of planted and painted for many years. Mm -hmm. um, there's Rose Quartz mysteries, the diamonds, 
I can, I'm not going to say anything, but you know, there's, I'm not going to dig into spoilers, but there have been some major things that you landed, I think, very successfully, very emotionally powerful. Um, how do you feel when you reveal a big thing that, you, that you've had in your back pocket for a long time, like the nature of Garnet earlier in the seasons, and now we have big things? Like, do you feel relieved, or do you feel like, oh, crap, I, I, I wasted, or you, like, do you feel sad when it's gone because now you can't play with it? Oh, no, it's a huge relief. <laughs> okay. Because <laughs> up I mean, until... we like it too, yeah. Up until it, once it's out, if it gets out and it managed to not leak, uh, yeah. and, uh, and we uh, get to the day and everybody sees it, that's yeah. like, and then it's, it's great. It's mm -hmm. great. We got, to, we got to garn it. Nobody knew till it happened. That was yeah. amazing. And then the next one was like Peridot being small, which some people figured out. <laughs> but, but no, like... You, because we pick screen caps for the episodes, right. uh, and when we're finishing episodes bef way before anything near them have aired, sure. so like yeah, of course. Uh, long in advance. So there was a big stretch where we were doing all the um, we called it the the barn arc at the time, mm. like all the stuff with with Peridot's arc, where she's small, but I, we had to pick screen caps so that she wouldn't be in. Because I was like, what if they put these? We don't know when they're going to put these out, and uh. if they put them out before you see her, and it was really hard to find an image from these Peridot episodes without Peridot in it. Also, they're not representative of the episode. Have you ever made fake ones? Like the, in the Avengers Infinity War, you see Hulk running, and that was, that was fake, apparently, like, right? Like, draw in something from scratch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there is... Do you do, like, psychic, psych ops like that to try to throw... <laughs> Are you messing with them? Are, do you ever? Are you... I feel like I shouldn't answer. Okay, never... Sometimes... <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, enough said. Yeah, I understand. Um, I, I will say sometimes we'll like um, take elements of an image, like if one character is smiling while the other one's talking and it's a strange in between, we'll like freeze half the frame. Oh, I and see, I see. That's, no, that doesn't that's count. That's really dry. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> but this is a, that's, a, that's a chunk of my day, is like choosing screen caps from episodes and making sure that they look yeah. good. Um, so I had a feeling, I don't feel bad now talking about what's happened recently, but I, I promise I won't talk about the last couple episodes. But we saw a couple, I mean, a couple major things happen that I had been waiting for for a long time, and was like, oh my god, we know everything. Mm -hmm. Like, the cat's out of the bag on almost all the big questions. And then that night later, I was like, oh no, wait, there's so much stuff I'm still, <laughs> I'm still wondering about. But um, I wanted to ask, like, did you always have a concrete ending in mind? And, and this isn't a spoiler, tell me the story arc thing, but I guess what I'm really asking is, some shows are made to run forever. Like, you have a character dynamic like The Simpsons, and you literally, or The Seinfeld, maybe, and you could just run it forever. And other things, you never know when it'll end, but you have a, a general sense of where the characters will end up. Which side of that is the show for you? And then I guess the second question is, did you ever get pressure to make it a certain kind of show? And, ha and has anything major changed? Um. I asked like six questions. I'm sorry. That's, <laughs> they're like all really big questions. Mm -hmm. too. Um, I always had a sort of ending theme in mind, an ending in mind, mm. but it has evolved a lot as we've worked on it. Oh, wow. Um, I can't really say. No, you don't have to. <laughs> I, I'm not, I, I swear I'm not asking about so plot we, points. It's more just like how the story developed. Yeah. We should do a, a, maybe a follow-up when the next uh, ones are out. But... Um, what the, what one, the hell does that mean? <laughs> okay, cool. I think one of the most sort of pivotal things came out of like a, a big writing day writer's room discussion of just a thing that was just bothering all of us for years. Like we, like, and this oh. is, I love, that's why it's my favorite thing is like when we manage to Aikido the biggest problem into the biggest solution, yeah, sure. it's that has so much power to me. And it comes from, that, that's the stuff that really comes from the team and the room and just navigating. <laughs> what is the? I, I put up oh. a picture of White Diamond. <laughs> I, I don't. <laughs> I don't know what Rebecca's gonna say. I swear, I'm just messing with her because we're because we're friends and I can. Um, yeah. Uh. I I will say last time we talked, I implied something and everyone laughed, and then it wasn't what happened. So don't listen to me. But <laughs> I have more um, stuff too. Yeah. Right, yeah. Um, in terms of being pressured to make it 
a different kind of show. Right. By that, the network or by... Well, sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think every show feels a lot of pressure. Uh, the interesting thing is that everything, for television, everything has been changing. Like, we've been on this churning sea of, like, what is television? What is children's mm -hmm, television? Mm -hmm. What is cable television? Do people watch TV? <laughs> like, in, you know, in this day and age. And, and um, continuity is actually one of the most difficult and controversial mm. things to do. Right. Um, because a lot of these cartoons are designed to rerun infinitely in any order everywhere across the world. Right. Yeah. Um, having a show with an ongoing story mm -hmm. is very difficult to air. Mm. Um, but then we would also, there would be moments where that was an exciting possibility. Like around the time we were doing the Peridot arc, uh, there was an excitement for like an eight episode continued sure. storyline. And, the, and then we did across several shows, you know, Stakes was like that too. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, when I was working on Adventure Time, the continuity was very, very subtle, and that was mm. something that we essentially were doing a little bit in secret. Um, right, right. And, Subversively. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm really glad, like, like, especially with a lot of these later episodes, um, it's a really interesting, fun challenge to do stuff that is not particularly linear. Yeah. I really like it. It's it's really hard to mm. make a really satisfying, self-contained story. And right. what we try to do is make sure that the characters are learning and changing, so that the even if the stories, when the stories are self-contained, they've learned or grown in a way that supports mm -hmm. the story that comes next. <clears throat> um, if they can do both things, I'm the I'm the most proud of those episodes. They can work yeah. both ways. Cliffhangers are fun, though. Yeah. <laughs> um, so. Yeah, they're they're uh, fun for us too. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I want to make sure I have uh, so many things to ask about, but one thing I want to talk about was um, related to the, the last time we talked, which was um, you, uh, since then I became a dad, um, and you said something of a daughter, and you said something really amazing to to me that I've actually circled back to a lot. Um, I won't read the whole thing, but we were talking about representations of, of queer identity and relationships in, in television generally and on kids' shows. And you said, um, I think if you wait to tell queer youth that it matters how you feel, how they feel, and that they are even a person, it's going to be too late. You have to talk about it to be what it is, to let it be what it is and gets to be for everyone. Uh, I think about fairy tales and Disney movies and the idea that love is something that's always discussed with children. And I think there's this idea that, oh, we should represent queer characters that are adults because there are adults that are queer, and you should know that's something that happens in the adult world. Um, th this comes up to me, uh, for me a lot as a parent, and I think in the, the two years since we talked, a, a lot has changed. Um, and I, I think it's wrong to say, oh, your comments were very prescient because you were directly related and had an impact on this, I think, cultural change that happened in kids' television. Um, and since then, we've had, let's see, I have pictures. <laughs> um, we had an incredible wedding episode. Mm -hmm. And I think other shows are starting to be unafraid to acknowledge that queer people exist and, oh my God, queer children exist as well. So um, I just wanted to check in two years later and, and ask you sort of how things have changed and, and, and how, how you felt about the wedding episode or anything you'd want to say about it. I mean, there... There's so much. I think since we talked last, I have been able to speak about this so much more. Uh, and I, I wasn't, when we spoke at MOCA, I was not out. Mm -hmm. And being able to talk about why this matters to me personally has helped a great deal. Um, but also just because we were being discouraged from having the characters be openly LGBTQ plus, uh, because we were being discouraged from that, I also was not really in a position to say that I was bisexual. Mm -hmm. um, and by 2016, I just, I couldn't function anymore. I had to, I had to talk about why this was important. Mm. And Hearing these, hearing these concepts come to me directly, hearing these notes come to me directly, really feeling the, the pressure that being someone, in, being someone in kids entertainment and also making something yeah. for children, yeah. that this would be inappropriate to discuss. Um, 
it made me start to understand that I had been told that indirectly by everything I had ever watched as a child. Yeah, for sure. Um, hearing, it, hearing it directly and having it, it really hurt directly, and that indirect hurt of realizing that I, not only was I not discussing this in terms of my work, but also not with my family and not with my friends. Mm -hmm. um, suddenly realizing, the yeah, other kids, it's so, it's so casual. No one is horrified to talk about how Charlie Brown likes the little red-headed girl. Yeah. You know, that's not, that's not shocking uh, or newsworthy. Um, the idea that queer kids exist is not at all new, and it's interesting because uh, in the 90s, I, I started reading a lot more about this and getting involved in more communities and community centers and with people that I honestly needed when I was younger but mm. was able to discover because they were reaching out to me because of the show and what it meant mm. to the queer youth at these centers. Um, I read this fascinating artifact called the um, Queer Nation Manifesto from Queer Nation. Mm. And I think everyone knows Queer Nation because they, uh, we're here, we're queer, get used to it. That's them. They invented mm -hmm. that. Everybody's heard that. They had another chant, two, four, six, eight, how do you know your kids are straight? Mm. That, <laughs> that did not stick. And I think that there's a reason. Yeah. This is where the, the, as things have moved forward, the line has been at kids. How do we get our heads around this as mm. kids? Because there's this need to protect straightness as a default. Mm -hmm. um, and it's actually interesting to watch a lot of the responses, you know, because everything can be really gleeful and joyful, but, but there are still a lot of comments like, I love this, this made me gay, I love this character, they turned me gay. Mm -hmm. That only works if you think this is the default, and we think that is the default because we've been told that is the default, and it's not. Mm -hmm. It's not a default. And I want <laughs> this to shift, please. Because I think, <laughs> I think it would just be. <laughs> it would be a healthier life for a lot of people. Yeah. So. yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it. Um, well, I just wanted to. And we're friends, so this sounds weird. But as a parent of a young kid. I just want to thank you for what you're doing. Yeah, it, oh. you, you've, I've even started to confront, you know, you think of yourself as being a progressive person, blah, 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 and then you check yourself with all these small little things, even with your, your own child, and then, uh, yeah, so I think the conversation we had and the show you've created has, is an, an incredible teaching tool, so I just want to thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Sure, we have time for people's questions. Okay, we do. Good, good, good. Um, so um, I kind of just had one. This is a totally separate topic, but um, uh, I was asked. I was um, wondering a little bit about studio stuff, and if no one else likes this, we can move on. But um, specifically related to sort of what you were talking about in terms of representation and just the kinds of stories you want to tell. Um, 2018 is a continuation of a strange sort of sequence where there's all these different big media companies doing, I think, what feels like a gold rush to try to tie up creators to make content for apps and for different things. Um, do you think, uh, I guess the question is, can a story like Steven, or a show like Steven, I suppose, only be created these days as a television show for a big network TV? And I guess what I'm asking about is the resourcing behind it and the kinds of stories. And for your next thing you do, whatever that might be, do you think it would be another huge labor and time intensive and money intensive production like Steven, or do you think you would want to do something smaller or different? Um, well, for Steven to be exactly what it is um, re requires a team, uh, a huge team in Los Angeles to mm -hmm. Doing all the different facets of production, and then two other teams uh, in Korea mm -hmm. uh, that that Sunmin and RDK that are also doing a huge amount of work. It's, I don't think that there is a way to do this on a smaller scale and have it be exactly like what we've done. Mm -hmm. But there are definitely ways to tell stories like this mm -hmm. in other mediums mm -hmm. or on a slightly smaller scale with a smaller team. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and then there's also a matter of sort of people versus time, or if you have a lot more time, yeah. you could do something of a, of a big scale with less people. Hmm. Uh, if you have very little time, you, can, you might need a huge amount of people. Um, hmm. I think that going into Stephen, I tried to conceptualize it to be something that I could share with my team, that I could work with a huge team, and it hmm. wouldn't be like my comics where I had this very singular vision I was trying to execute. I wanted it to be able to be something more shared. Um, and that, I think, would have to be part of planning for a project like this, mm. too. And that, that extends everywhere. Like, uh, I like to talk to my directors at some in RDK and mm. know which characters they like so they can get the episodes they want to work on. And oh, wow. um, you know, I, I want <clears throat> feedback from everyone. So mm. um, I think in terms of being scooped up by a company to make work that's personal yeah. and to get that kind of budget and time and mm -hmm. team and building for the team to be in, you know, that's part of it too. Yeah. Uh, I would really recommend independent comics because that was a training ground for me to try out stories. Mm. Mm. Uh, when I was a teenager coming to this, this convention, I would come with my zines uh, that I was working on, I would trade them with people, I would get mm. feedback from my heroes about the stories I was writing, Mike Mignola was here one mm -hmm, year, and mm -hmm. we traded books. Eric Powell, mm -hmm. um, we traded books, and you know I've talked to them ever since about story. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's it's really about conceptualizing the project for the medium. It's like how you, it's never yeah. fun to like read a comic when someone's like, "Well, this really is supposed to be a movie," but. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, or this is my storyboard, but I printed it out like a comic. It's it's very different. I feel like I have a a very personal hang up about storyboards being printed as comics because you really have to approach them differently. And what I love about uh, what I love about comics and what I miss about comics is that it's such a different way of expressing time. Because mm -hmm. in animation, time is literal, and in storyboarding, it's it's set up for that. You're you know you have your shot and the things that are going to happen in that shot and and it's sort of static, but in comics, the flow of the page and the composition of the panel, the, the breathing room, the shot you choose, mm. how you navigate it gives you the sense of how fast or slow you're moving through time, and mm. that is just so exciting. Mm. So if someone wants to do a project like Steven, uh, I, I was dreaming about doing something like that while I was doing comics, but yeah. the comics weren't that. It wasn't like my consolation prize or anything. I right. was like, I'm gonna train myself to tell certain stories, I'm just mm. going to come up with a lot of ideas. Um, and <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm still using some of the ideas from my comics, like like That's little action scenes and, and story points. There, there was a comic I never actually made, but called Bonnie and Jess, which Pug Davis was actually a comic that Bonnie, Bonnie and Jess were going to be reading, and then I made Pug Davis <laughs> instead. <laughs> that it was going to exist, but, but Bonnie and Jess was about a pair of lesbian bodyguards that travel around just like fighting people, which is more or less what the Steven Universe is. <laughs> <laughs> and so like I, I, you know, even, it's really important to make things and finish things. Finishing your projects is yeah. huge. Um, Cause you really have to be able to push through. And also when you finish it, you get that experience of knowing you're not set. I, at least for me, knowing you're not satisfied with it, but getting it done yeah. anyway and being yeah. ready to jump to the next thing, that's, that is a skill to learn and, and build up. Like, oh, I'm not 100% happy with this, but I've got to get it done and out, and then I'll make the next thing, and then I'll be more happy with that thing. You'll never be happy, I'm just telling you um, <laughs> in you, advance. You heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> no, you'll, okay, no. No, no, I, yeah. Um, you know, with the, with the project. And, and that... Um, that's not, that's old me. You'll no, be happy. Yeah, I know. Yeah, Happiness no. is possible. <laughs> well, I do, I do think that, um, what you're, I think what you're really saying is like that healthy, um, there's, there's a, th as a comics publisher, I, I talk to a lot of young cartoonists and trying to, you know, help and support people's emerging work. And I think the exciting thing is when someone's has a healthy dissatisfaction with their work, not an unhealthy mm -hmm. one. Yeah. Like if you make something like, here's this, you know, made it sucks. It's like, okay, well, um, <laughs> This, I can't wait to dig in. That is, that is well, that's that's tough. But I think that yeah. that feeling is a really positive feeling. I agree completely. It me it means you believe that you can do better. Yes. That is the feeling that you're feeling. It hurts, but ultimately, 
the glass half full version of that is that you know you know your best work is not this, and that means that you believe that it's something, and you're pursuing that something in the future. Yeah. Um, and so even that pang of dissatisfaction, I think, can become a source of pride because you know mm -hmm. that you're working towards something. And when you get that, when you do that drawing that you're really happy with, yeah. oh, there's like nothing better. And I haven't had that feeling in a while because I have to run from, I have to go really fast a lot of times for mm. work. Um, there was one day recently where I was like, I just have to, I have to do a good drawing. I really just need to do one good drawing. Um, <laughs> like, I, I'm like, Cat Joe, I'm gonna hit this scene. I'm just gonna, do, let me, I'm just gonna draw this one scene. <laughs> it's just like. I just wanna walk out the day being like, I nailed it. Yeah, I just wanna do some shading on some hair. Like, I just wanna do a good looking <laughs> drawing. Um, that's, it's, it's worth it to, uh, to fight for that. But it's also important to let things go by to that function and functionality is. Well, that's a good segue. I was gonna ask um, about how you feel about your old work. Um, oh, I that's some, my old work. I have some old work here. <laughs> like, don't, um, don't come for me for this. This isn't even mine. This is a friend's I borrowed. But um, Rebecca's done, uh, this is how Rebecca and I met originally was, I think we traded zines. Uh, at Alternative Press Expo in San Francisco, maybe. I think mm -hmm. you and Ian were there and we traded. But um, uh, I, yeah, I, won I wonder, a, a lot of the older work has found its way online because your fans are very voracious. Um, <laughs> uh, and, but I, I'm just curious, that same feeling, um, when you look back at your, the comics that you did before and during Adventure Time, how, how do you feel about them now? Do you, do you feel very critical of them or do you see elements there that you still find intriguing, or maybe they're a snapshot. And, and I've noticed that the people who have found your work online, including some of the work you shared in the book we did together, are like trying to tie it back to Steven in any way possible. Like, <laughs> that character is Proto Lapis, and that guy in the background of Pug Davis looks like Lars, which I thought today, this morning, when I was reading. But, um, uh -huh. but that, I, I, that is Lars. It Fun is fact, Lars. Oh. Lars, we, we always figured he'd go to space because he's in the background. Wait, what? <laughs> Wait, what? Yeah. That is Lars. That is Lars. Lars is oh one of the God, oldest, because, oldest characters. Wait, oh my God. He's like a character from, he's a character from college. That. Uh, he's a character I had back in college. How, wait, how early do you plant these seeds? There's going to be something you said when you were six, and it's going to be the ending of, okay. Um, I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can say. Is a retro retconned in? Well, or? there's, I mean, Pug was my first try at sort of the sci-fi sci mm -hmm. space stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of parallels. Uh, there are a lot of parallels. I think by, by the time we got into some of the Peridot stuff, Ian would make fun of me because he's like, we're just doing Pug now, it's just Pug. <laughs> like, it's, you know, it's aliens and it's, it's sci-fi. I'll come back, yeah. Um, but I have some Pug stuff here. Yeah, and, and these characters are, are, have made their way in mm. different forms into, into everything. You know, Pearl is very much like the blouse, but the blouse is not a liar, so they're a little different. Uh, well, she's not anymore. You know what? That's not even true anymore. That, I think, I used to say that, but it's not true you, anymore. You said finally, that when we talked two years she, ago. Yes, and it's And I was true. like, what is she talking about? Why is she picking on Pearl? And I'm like, oh, no, I yeah, get it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, well, the thing is, like, like Blas can't keep a secret to save his yeah, life. Yeah, exactly. He yeah. is a completely open book, which is not, not true about Pearl at all. Um, I'm just, uh, while we're talking, I'm just showing some of <laughs> Okay. Um, I mean, when I look at this old stuff, I, I see them as learning experiences, mm. but I also feel that way about everything I'm doing now. And I think for me, I've always tried to set up projects in order for, to have them be learning experiences. Like mm. I never want the last page of a book to look exactly like the first page of the book. I want to yeah. be better at what I do. And I want that journey to be captured inside of the project. And I really feel that way about Steven also like everything yeah. is everything is like that. I can't I feel like I said that thing out of a, as a reflex and it's not even true anymore. <laughs> oh. I think that that I feel sad that I did that. No. <laughs> it's okay. You were you were protecting a spoiler previously I and was. then it became a internalized uh Yeah, I've just I'm in the I'm in the I habit. was offended last time you said it. <laughs> but that's the thing, you know, like in the that's what's so interesting about Steven as a learning experience because the show started with all these characters who were really repressing all these things they were so unhappy with about themselves. And the course of the show has been them finally being able to 
look at those things and accept those things and move on. That was not planned at the beginning. That's just what was going on <laughs> in yeah. reality. Yeah. And uh, when I look at Stephen, it's really moving. And I think Stephen is a lot more personal than my personal work from when I was um, younger because these... It's interesting. One of the strangest episodes, I think, was Reformed with Amethyst, mm. where I was—I remember talking with my team and being like, "You know that thing where like you can't introspect because it makes you feel like a monster," <laughs> and everyone's like, "No, we don't know that. <laughs> what is what is that?" And I'm like, "You know," and like, and people are like, "You should be like this," and then you're like, "Okay, I guess," and then you like try to do it, but you can't because you just can't do it, and they're like, "No, what are you talking about?" <laughs> and like, but. I think by the end of working on that episode, I was like, this is not, I don't know if this is a normal mm. experience to have. Um, and, but then, you know, she, it happens to her too, because she's going yep, through it. And a sure. lot of, I mean, what, so one thing that I think is amazing about getting to do this work and being an artist is that you are sharing things about yourself with with the people that you love and trust and respect as other artists. And you just learn a lot by bouncing off of each other and, and you really have to you really have to trust somebody to go into ideas that are that are personal and that you care about but then the fascinating part is try, trying to explain and clarify why they're personal and important to you mm -hmm. which is not something that you're always in a position to say out loud yeah. uh, so I recommend doing comics, doing writing, you know, work and working with a, a team. I think if I had been alone writing these stories, I don't know if they ever would have become about these characters realizing that they're in trouble and getting help because that yeah. I didn't know. Yeah. I'm I'm happy with how happy you seem. <laughs> Um, so we, we only have a few minutes left, so we're going to do some Q&A. Uh, we won't have time for a lot of questions, but if you have something, feel free to come to um, the microphone on either side. Um, and then uh, we only have a few minutes, so hopefully not the longest questions on earth. But And then at the end, someone will remind me details about Rebecca signing later. Um, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back and... And keep signing. I'm really sorry that that no, no, no. got cut short. Okay, um, we'll start on this side. Yeah, thanks. Hi. Hello. Um, I was wondering, in terms of how you... Okay, with fandom, I always feel like they respond very strongly to like the romantic aspects of oh, the story or to your work. And I mean, I don't read a lot of fanfics, but I get the impression there's like a lot of... It focuses a lot on the romance. And... You know, even if they don't, like, when you showed, like, the wedding photo, everyone was like, oh, So, like, you, you know, you kind of go in knowing that's what people respond to. But, like, you don't make the entire show, like, Stephen and Connie go on a date. Like, that's, you know, that's, it's scattered throughout. So I guess I was wondering how you decide how much to focus on the romantic aspects when you know that that's what the fans, that the fans will respond really strongly to it. Well, the show is so much about love, and the core of it is really my relationship with my brother and that, that sibling love and best friend love, I think is primary in the show for me. But we really want to explore relationships and romantic relationships certainly have to be a part of that exploration. So I try to incorporate it when it makes sense for the characters. I mean, Ruby and Sapphire and Garnet, I think are the, the pillar of romantic love as expressed through the show. and. There are things I want to say about romantic love with them that I haven't really seen in cartoons, especially characters that have been in a relationship for an, ex an extremely long time and know each other really well. One of the things I was really excited about with the wedding was that I don't know if I've ever seen two cartoon characters who've been dating f for an extended amount of time and made a choice to get married, then get married. Usually it just sort of happens because it's like how you win or something at the end. <laughs> Uh, but they talk about it, they have to spend time apart in order mm -hmm. to be a little healthier and, and come back together and actually have a discussion about is this something that we want to do and then, they, and then they do it. I really wanted to see <laughs> that kind of romantic relationship, one that wasn't easy, like they struggle. You see them break up and get back together. That can happen and I think if you're, if you're a kid 
watching cartoon romance, you, you might think that nobody ever fights or that, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, what even happens after a lot of these characters get married? Like, you don't, you don't know how their relationship turns out. <laughs> Hopefully it stays good between, you know, Ariel and the prince or whatever. I'm sure, uh, you know, I'm sure it, it'll be okay. But I'd like to see, it would be cool to see if the yeah. whole sequel was them, like, sort of like, well, you know, you have, you know, it's great, you have legs, like, let's, let's go. <laughs> um, like, let's what kind go, of, yeah, what kind of meals out. do they cook together? To make, yeah, yeah, we need to make time to, like, go out on the town, like, the carriage thing, let's do it again, you know. <laughs> or maybe we should do something different, because, like, like, are they spontaneous? Like, what do they do together? <laughs> That's great. Um, okay, we'll I'll take a question from this side. Thank you so much. Hi. Uh, is this on? Um, is it working? It is, yeah. You just have to get close to it. Hi. Um, so I, I, I'm going to try and keep this question short. I'm also going to try and get through it without crying because mm -hmm. I expect that I'm going to get emotional in the middle of a sentence. Um, I am an artist, like so many people here probably, uh, aspiring. Um, and I fell in love with cartoons when I was a kid. And when I was a kid, lots of cartoons were like Rocco's Modern Life and, and Rocket Power. And you know, they're good cartoons, but you know, they treated me like a child. And then slowly, there started to be more cartoons that didn't treat me like a child. They could, they could still be fun and engaging and cool, but have more deeper meanings and themes and then um, I think Avatar The Last Airbender in 2006 was definitely a pillar of animation for me that made me think, wow, animation could be something different. And then even more in the past few years, in this shift that I think you've seen and definitely been a part of with Adventure Time, and especially, especially Steven Universe, I feel even more now like you know, anything is possible with animation, that I could go into a room and pitch a heartfelt idea for animation that has you know, a deeper meaning, something that means a lot to me, and not be laughed out of the room and actually be taken seriously, possibly. Um, and I think maybe a lot of people in here have that same dream. Um, so to you, I feel incredibly grateful for your influence in the industry, and I also feel frightened and scared that I could pursue this dream, and if it fails, then it's just my fault entirely. <laughs> um, so my question for you is, how would you describe uh, your experience as an industry leader uh, creating uh, content with, with actual purpose? And what words of encouragement would you give to aspiring, dreaming artists like me who feel intimidated by the industry, but also excited to try and pursue it. Um, I have seen, from my experience, that the people who enter the industry and stay and work and keep pitching and pitching and and just never stop generating ideas and going for it, like eventually you you will succeed if you just don't stop. The people who don't succeed are the people who stop, um, because at that point, like when everyone sees like this person you know, has ideas and is really perseverant and like they put in all this time, like if you, someone who's maybe worked on, you know, like several other people's shows and everyone knows them because they're there and they've been doing good work for these other shows and like if you're pitching and that one doesn't go through, then maybe the next one or the next one doesn't go through and then the third one is the one that goes through or the fifth one is the one that goes through. If you just keep going, like eventually it will work because people see that you're, you become like a, a pillar. A lot of people will drop off when they don't instantly get their show. Um, and then they never get their show, because they left. If you just stay, like it'll work out. And it's hard to stay, because this work is really hard. Um, and especially if you're keeping up personal work on the side, you know, no, nobody can, people can't do that. Like nobody can do whatever you do. Your personal work and the show that you would make is not gonna be like anyone else's show. And they really need interesting new ideas from new people. So honing that is really important. Just click, like, if it doesn't click, it's not a failure, you know? Like, there's so much, it's, there's so much positive about the experience of something not clicking, because you, you have to look at it and be like, what about this didn't 
hit with people like so much of so much of what we do it uh, even with each other on the team is just like selling ideas. You know, you have to do a song and a dance and be like, and be like, I'm gonna make you like this. You know, and I do it too. I try to do it to my team because I don't, I don't like to put something through and just be like, this is what I want. We're gonna do this. Like, I wouldn't want to do that. <laughs> like, I really try to be like, oh, wouldn't this, wouldn't this be amazing? And then they'll say it like this. And when I read a line that I write, I try to like read it the way I'd want the characters to read it. Like, you're, you're always selling, uh, which for someone who is maybe uh, a little socially anxious like me is really challenging. It, it used to feel, especially back on Adventure Time, because I'd be pitching songs, I was so horrified to sing in front of anybody. Um, it almost feels a little like extortion, like the ideas are on the line, like I have to, I have to perform this in order to get people to like it, in order to get it through. I really don't want anyone to be looking at me. I would actually make Penn turn around sometimes <laughs> and just sing to the back of his head because I just didn't want him to see me. But you know, it's like you just have to keep making, generating stuff, making stuff, and just not stop. As long as you don't stop, it will work out. But stopping gets really tempting. But f failure is not a problem. Stopping is a problem. Uh, you have like, there, there will always be bad drawings. There will always be things that don't hit. And there will always be something in the room that just doesn't click with people. Because maybe you said it wrong or you stumbled on a line or something. Like it's, you know, but it's no problem if when you step back, you just kept moving forward. Um, so yeah, just don't stop. Please don't stop. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Um, I'm sorry to do this for everyone who lined up, but we talked too much and oh, we ran no. out of time. But Rebecca will be signing, okay. and so we'll have to keep the conversation going there. I'm so sorry. I no, no, we, I, it's my fault. We talked too much. But um, before we go, um, I, I just want, can you join me in thanking Rebecca Sugar? <laughs>